Webster is next on BCTV. Good morning. It is, as you know, open season on social credit, especially after their image-making weekend in British Columbia. And here this morning, on whom we can have open season, is the Deputy Premier of the Province of British Columbia, the Honourable Grace McCarthy, Human Resources. Didn't even put up the allowances for people on welfare to the cost of living. That's what she's going to have to depend, to, to defend, that and other items. Also here this morning, and positively his last and final pre-retirement tour of this nation, is that extraordinary High Commissioner from the United Kingdom, Sir John Ford. Remember the little waddle, skate and tell? Sir John Ford, to give us a, a sum up of his time in Canada and to tell us what is happening at the Mother of Parliaments in London. After the break. <laughs> What are we selling this morning? Uh, yeah, everything, everything. Oh, everything, <laughs> chat. It's just as well we don't see them. Some of them are tasteless. <laughs> Sir John Ford, of course, is the High Commissioner from the United Kingdom in Ottawa. And Sir John, I had such a good laugh at you and Ian Waddell and your skate and tell party that I haven't made up my mind yet whether or not you uh, in fact, created a storm in a teacup or interfered improperly in Canada's constitutional crisis by advising certain members of the opposition what way, what, what they should know about what the British Parliament would do. Sir, take the oath in your right hand and tell me, do you plead guilty or not guilty to anything? <laughs> that is a very, I suppose really one ought to plead guilty to everything and the normal principle we're all, with. no, I think that it was uh, an incident which looking back on, I mean, a lot of water's flown under the arches since. I certainly have no uh, bitterness of any kind to anyone. In fact, I had an extremely pleasant lunch with Ed Broadbent afterwards. And as I told somebody, I think the thing that uh, indelibly is on my memory more than anything else is a new respect for politicians, because there was I, a diplomat, who normally never expects to hit the headlines, suddenly finding myself pilloried in your headlines and caricatures, etc., and totally new experience. And I reckon your politicians listen to that, uh, Deputy Premier, res deserve a great deal of respect for uh, the way they put up with this all the time. Well, now, you were described as Sir John the Meddler at one particular case. In fact, though, to be serious for a second, uh, are you not, is a diplomat not entitled, as Gene Wads obviously must do in London, is a UK diplomat not entitled to lobby his government's views on anyone who will listen to him at any time? Oh, I think this is quite true. We are. In fact, I made, uh, as, as I put, pointed out at my press conference, uh, I think that uh, one is there to put over one's own government's view and also to explain what's happening in your own country. And this is the job of the diplomat, and uh, one does it all the time. And uh, sometimes, of course, one, it happens to be a contentious subject and it's a little bit difficult. And uh, on things like energy, for example, one has done it in the past. And but one doesn't expect to be quoted by the people whom one chats up at parties in Ottawa, does well, one? Not, no, not, but I think it was probably a certain amount of misunderstandings anyway. And so I certainly no resentment against Ian Waddell, and I hope sometime I meet him again. I think that a uh, very nice chap, and I had a joy talking to him at that party. And I what was it you told him at that time again? Sorry? What was it you told Ian? Oh, I think I was talking about various, various things. I think I remember rightly. I was talking about the parliamentary situation in the UK and not to take it for granted that Parliament would act like a rubber stamp, uh, which is, uh, of course, is something that needed to be. Well, it's uh, now saying. a couple of months later, and there's an old fashioned report that I must now ask you, formally and on the record. What position do you think the United Kingdom Parliament will take when the package gets to London this time round? Well, Jack, when I joined the diplomatic service, my first boss said, 
John, there's a bit of advice I can give you. Never answer a hypothetical question. And this is rather a hypothetical question. The, the debate has not yet finished in your parliament. We don't know actually when it's going to come. We haven't got the exact final uh, package. wording package yet. Uh, the British government's position is quite clear. Mrs. Thatcher has said it many times that it will be dealt with in accordance with precedent and the law as expeditiously as possible. And uh, that really is all I can say. Uh, I absolutely couldn't forecast what particular backbenchers will say, but uh, I'm sure it will go to Parliament. And I think the sooner we can get your constitution out of our hair, the happier we'll be pleased. Yeah, the fact remains that you did give some advice not to take for granted that the UK Parliament would do as it was bid by, on this situation by the Canadian government. That was what you said previously. Yes, I think I said you cannot take the backbencher for granted, that he has his views, he knows he's got constitutional responsibilities, and he takes them seriously. And of course one saw uh, that the Foreign Affairs Committee did, did a report in which they expressed certain worries. Well, a lot of more water has gone under the, flowed under the arches since then. Uh, I don't know what the latest assessment is of parliamentary opinion on this at all. Why did you did make a quick trip to London, as I recall, when the skate and tell thing broke. Afterwards, yes, I went back for consultation, which is a very good thing to do, because I wanted to get up to date, and my government wanted to find out exactly what I'd said and uh, exactly what the position was, and uh, so one went back, as one does from time to time, to get the most up-to-date situation. And I had to come to your defense, you know. When people were saying you'd been chopped for unacceptable conduct, I had to pull out the clip when you were here the last time in which you had already announced I heard uh, about your that, retirement yeah. in the spring. Well, it was, uh, it was just unfortunate that the announcement of my successor, which had just uh, gone through all the, the uh, clearances here, came out just at the same time as this other <laughs> instance. Everyone put two and two together and made five. In all your, what, 35, 36 years in the diplomatic service? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been, yeah, since 1947. Yes, it's, uh, yes, 34 years now. Have you ever run into such a, an embarrassment before? Because it must have been some kind of embarrassment to you. To well, be I, the center uh, of a storm. No, I haven't really had quite that one, but I remember when I was in Indonesia and I visited the prison island of Buru, I was rung up by the BBC after, because I had talked about the problems of an island which you had the plans to resettle a lot of prisoners without any women. And I had said, well, of course, before any resettlement can really go ahead, there must increase the number of ladies on the island. And I was rung up by London to say, what's this we hear about you advocating black slave tracking? And I thought, well, that was very embarrassing too, but actually it was quite a false report. So these things blow up and blow down again. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all over and done with now. Oh, yes. And when I, do you actually quit the job? I, on the 10th of May. 10th of May, back to the UK. Well, I'm going down to uh, um, the United States to stay with my wife's family. We spend about a month in the United States driving around and then go back to the are UK. Are you taking bids on the Rusty Rolls Royce? We are indeed, yes. Well, well uh, uh, tell me about the Rusty Rolls Royce. After well, all, well, it, may, it may be a portent of things to come. Uh, Perhaps a portent of something to do with things British. Well, this is this is a this is a, a fairly old one. It's a 1973 model, and you know the a little salt, bit rusty. The salt, the salt in the roads that they put down in Ottawa plays hell with all motor cars, and ours, the bodywork has got very rusted uh, through its side, and uh, it's an armoured car. In fact, I think it's the only armoured Rolls in uh, North America. And so uh, the question was, should we get it all repaired and put right? And it was going to cost a great deal. And it's not terribly satisfactory because it's very heavy. And uh, it's very heavy on gas. And so I suggested the best thing to do would be to get a Jaguar and uh, sell the rolls, thinking that perhaps somebody who needs protection might like to pay a very good price for a car which I reckon knew would cost you nearly 200000 Matter of fact, there was a time during this crisis when you might have used the rolls as a matter of choice. Uh, not in this crisis, no. Perhaps in the old days of FLQ, yes, but not now. Well, that would be why it was obtained after that the cross it, affair. That's it, yeah. So it's on the block now? It's on the block now. If you've got, you're a mafia godfather, if there are such people in so John, uh, Vancouver. Know, they'd never do this on the BBC, but I'd like you to do, just, I'll give you 30 seconds to do a quick, sharp, sharp commercial to sell the rolls rice. Well, if anyone I know one guy who, who will yeah. buy it, right? Yeah. So just think quickly for, and give me a 30-second sale of the Rolls Royce. But if anyone wants a unique car that will triple in value in five years and be worth a fortune, at the same time give you care and protection and guarantee that you're not shot at, my Rolls Royce is it. And if you pay 60000 for it, 20000 to get it into full working order, you'll have a supercar which brand new would cost you about 150000 to two hundred. Is that a firm price or are you taking bids? Taking bids. So you've got two Mafia Godfathers here. I would like to take it higher than that. 
No, I'm very sorry you mentioned the Mafia Godfather, but delete that because I'm going to offer the car to two prominent British Columbia citizens right now. Herb Capozzi or Nelson Scalbania. They're guys who play racquetball for $10,000 a game and build things. Very nice fellows for the YMCA and the YWCA. So, so John will be in town until the end of the week, and if you want to have a bidding match on the bulletproof Rolls Royce, you may have it. Correct, sir? Correct, yes. Yeah, so just send in your bids to Ottawa. You were a little bit short in your seconds. I don't think you should take up a second career as a commercial announcer for ITV in Britain. Haven't had I need some more practice from you, Jack. Things British after the break. <laughs> Sir John Ford, the retiring UK High Commissioner. Sir John, what about things Britain these days? Uh, Maggie Thatcher seems to meet trouble at every turn, but is the inflation at all being brought under control? Oh, indeed it is. I mean, the last uh, figures just announced show that over the past year, it's gone down from a period of 21.5, I think, at the highest point in April last year, down to 12.8%. And the last six-month figure, over six months, it's only eight, eight, uh, about 8%. Uh, percent which is tremendous reduction. But at what cost of unemployment? At what cost? Well, I noticed that the government had to step back in their confrontation with the miners, for instance. At what cost to the economy? Well, the cost to the economy is very heavy uh, in the sense that unemployment now is two, over two and a half million and still rising. Industry is having a very difficult time indeed. But, uh, and this I think is where the light looks as if it might be the end of the tunnel, strike situation is better than it's been since 1940. That's the lowest strike rate since 1939. Uh, one example, uh, a very good one, I think, is the Ford Motor Company's subsidiary in England produced profits last year, if I remember rightly, over half a billion dollars. And it was the only bit of the Ford empire which produced profits. Well, mm -hmm. this is a pretty good a sign. The uh, shakeout of uh, labor from industry has been terrific, but companies are now much leaner and able to compete in the world. Mind you, with two and, and a half million unemployed, the weight of the social services, the social service system must be incredible. And this is the reason, one of the reasons why the government are having such difficulty with their, their budgeting. Uh, the cost of financing the unemployment, the cost of financing the Crown Corporation's native steel is making it impossible for them to cut government expenditure like they had hoped. And that's why the taxes went up dramatically in this budget. But uh, the We blame ma many of our troubles on you, of course, because we follow the leader with you. You started off with the index pensions, the unlimited index pensions for civil servants, and we follow. Is there much of a furor about that in Britain, or do people accept the kind of specious nonsense we get here? Well, everyone should have index pensions, regardless of where the money is going to come from. Well, we just had uh, a committee presided over by one of our businessmen, Mr. Scott of Lucas, and he examined the whole question. And uh, rather to my surprise, he came up with very much the, that sort of line. What one ought to do is to uh, try and get the pension, whole pension position uh, improved. But, and the real proof of the, of the uh, whole thing, it seems to me, is inflation. If you can get inflation down to... Uh, very low figures indeed, then indexing means very little because your pensions don't change, and this is what we all ought to be going for. British tourist industry has suffered undoubtedly, certainly since I was there last year, because of the incredible cost of things. Is the deflation helping that at all, or does the tourist who go to Britain still have to take wads of dollar pound notes which spend as per one dollar bill. One pound equals one dollar. It depends what you're buying and where you're staying. If you go to London, I think that is exactly right. And if you want meals at expensive restaurants in London, or if you want to buy property in London, I, I think that's very, very true. If, on the other hand, you go through where you're going to go through Scotland, if you like to go into rural areas and do bed and breakfast and that sort of thing, and you'll be quite cheap. I know mean, a very good bed and breakfast. When did, you last do a, when did you last do a bed and breakfast? Well, I John? know what I'm going to do when I get back home. Start doing it very quickly. <laughs> On retirement. I, I like going out in the villages and doing that in the town, small back areas, towns. How much? About $15, I think. You can still get a good bed and breakfast. So, uh, that's $15 it. per head, yeah, per yeah, person, yeah. for bed and breakfast. Yeah. And meet the real people. That's it. Um, what about the political situation now? You, you're always quite forward on that. With Shirley Williams and the others who are split away from the Labour Party, is, in, is this, in fact, in your opinion, emerging as a separate party? 
I mean, here we talk. Yes, uh, certainly. I mean, that's, uh, it, it definitely is emerging. I mean, if you say, if you take the number of MPs now, there are 12 uh, Labour MPs who, and one Conservative MP who have now joined the Social Democrats. And that gives them 13, I think, or f 14, Something like that. which is slightly more than the Liberals. So uh, the, their representation in Parliament as of now is, uh, is, is bigger than the Liberals. Now, if one looks at the public opinion polls, uh, which is not a really a fair thing to look at because you're not fighting an election now and you've got, before you have an election, you've got to have people in each constituency. So this is not, but the public opinion poll suggests at the moment that a, uh, a, a party uh, which was, was in effect a liberal SD alliance would in fact get a very high percentage of the public's vote at this particular juncture. And Britain for the first time, really, the first effective time in ever, we might finish up with a three-party system. Tories, Social Democrats and the traditional yes. trade yes. union Labour Party. Yes, of course, which it did have in the early days when Labour started and the Liberals ah, pulled their very on. small. You, that you had that period. And so to be going back to a situation like that. Now, uh, but it's much too soon, to my mind, to say whether this will, uh, in effect, happen because the Social Democrats have got to get people in constituencies prepared to fight an election. Yes. And, of course, one doesn't know quite what effect that will have on the balance of the vote. I mean, it might take more votes off the... Uh, a traditional Labour Party, or it might um, take votes off the Liberals, or it might take votes off the Conservatives. Who could knows? Be, could be a very tricky situation. Could be quite an interesting situation. Has Britain succeeded in cutting down the numbers of migrants into the country with its new policies? Well, over the last few years, the number of uh, immigrants you're, you're, have been cut down. You're chock a block now. Well, right? Yes, it, uh, it has. But are the the latest uh, figures? I haven't seen. I'm afraid. I just don't know what the last year's figures were for the year before. Anyway, you know the figures for the money that will be generated uh, by Shy Dai. Are we allowed to say Shy Dai? Uh, well, this wedding. Yes, yes, I think I hope so. Yes. Um, it, Charles. Uh, yes, I think it'll be a very interesting occasion. Matter of fact, if you bump into him, I think you should tell him to stop riding horseback, don't you? He's been off twice. Well, I'm all in favour of people being doing gutty sports like that. You've got to have some uh, excitements in life, and it's a very. Uh, but he could break his bleeding royal neck. Couldn't he? Well, I suppose I mean, he could tread on a banana skin. I've heard of people treading on banana skins and doing themselves damage. I think well, one mustn't play too safe. You must enjoy life and be able to do things. And courage and guts are something that we all rather admire, don't you think so? Yes, I think so. I think you showed a lot of courage and a lot of guts <laughs> when you, after you had been denounced, not denounced is not the word, you had been, your behavior had been called unacceptable. And I must compliment you on the way you pulled off that press conference. But it's a very interesting experience. But the, the thing that I like most of all was that you, you fooled most Canadian politicians, most Canadian people, by doing it impeccably in each of our two official languages. Well, I wasn't impeccable in French. I forgot all my words at the crucial moment. Couldn't remember simple things like amitié. <laughs> you couldn't? <laughs> no. <laughs> Which was terrible. But a great, every diplomat, of course, should be able to speak both the official languages of the world, English Certainly, and Certainly, yes. And I will, when I go to Quebec, I always try and talk in uh, French, but the problem there is the Premier Levesque speaks such excellent idiomatic and slangy English that he rather puts one uh, at one's uh, disadvantage. Matter of fact, I think he speaks slightly better and more idiomatic English than even the elegant Prime Minister Trudeau. Just a little bit more idiomatic, wouldn't you agree? Very, very idiomatic indeed. Uh, well, sir, as we say cheerio for the moment, sir, give me the classic Ford pause. The Ford oh, well, this pause. one, you know the that? Well, that that's the relaxed, yeah. <laughs> that's the relaxed. Thank you very yeah, much, very sir. Good, Jack. Do try yeah. and keep out of trouble, will you, in your yeah. retirement? We'll and do sit down and you'll rip off the Michael Ford. Oh, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, we'll you. meet your successor. Who is he going uh, to be? Lord Moran. He's a Scot. He, he's Doctor's uh, son. Doctor's son, that's right. He's coming War in hero. June. Yes? Coming in June. Yeah. Ask him to drop in in the fall. I'll certainly warn him to. Yes, he's coming in the fall, I if should think. Tell him if he skates with me, I'll tell. <laughs> I will. <laughs> thanks to I'll Sir warn him. Ford. Grace McCarthy, Deputy Premier, after the break. Grace McCarthy is Deputy Premier of the Social Credit Government and Minister of Human Resources. The broad criticism already made against you in the new budget, which, by the way, it's an incredibly expansive budget, isn't it? I think it's a very uh, realistic budget for these times, and I believe that it has um, addressed the social services in our province, which, of course, I have a great interest in, 
and it says to the people of British Columbia that uh, we won't cut services, uh, but we will not either go into deficit uh, budgeting, and we say that we will have a balanced budget, balanced in social services and in economic initiatives. Yeah, but in and fact, you're taking an extra billion dollars in taxis out of the pockets of people in personal and corporate taxis to put the provincial budget up to the incredible figure of six billion dollars. But you, you do forget that you are uh, also reducing taxes for a great number of people. Uh, very uh, many uh, people are getting a break on personal income tax, the lower income families, the senior uh, peop citizens and as well, and uh, that covers thousands and thousands of families. And uh, just recently, uh, it, I have announced income assistance rates. Uh, we have not reduced any social services. In fact, we've improved the infant development program in my uh, you cut out area a few grants, interest. but you kept your programs. Is that right? We haven't cut out any um, uh, of the grants. We, uh, in terms of um, my ministry, do you mean? Uh, we, from year to year, always assess the grants. Services, the community right. grants, Let's and there will be some who will be cut out because the general, they are not get delivering the service. The general criticism of your new rates, while they are up, I think, an average of uh, 12 percent, 12 percent, mm -hmm. is that they do not meet, in most of the cases, the actual inflationary cost of living. That therefore you are being cold and hard-hearted to those at the lowest end of the income scale in British Columbia on human resource allowances. Now, well, but that's not so. Um, my figures are right, broadly speaking, 12 well, and 13.2. Yes, although you'll note that in the $24 million that we have just placed in this, um, uh, in this particular past uh, week into the, uh, for, it's, um, for April 1st implementation, You'll note that we have uh, added uh, dollars to uh, specific areas. We've weighted it to different groups who, who were falling behind because of the nature of their housing and because of the nature of their, of their category, if you like. And this is weighted to the uh, areas of the uh, single uh, persons and the small families. I'm going to come to that in a moment, and mm -hmm. I'm going to show you the table so people know what happens. But one of the major changes that you made the mm -hmm. last time I remember you being on the program about it, was that you took away the, the shelter overages and you put people on flat, adjustable shelter rates, correct? Well, not quite correct. Let me just explain that. You recall the time that when you're talking about the old crisis grants, aren't you? Right. <coughs> we and did, the, the we rental take overage that away. grants. Two years ago, we took away that, that crisis grant situation because uh, it was a question of the squeaky wheel getting all of the services. And we said, we're going to allow the people to get, uh, to have their utilities paid for within income assistance. That was for the first time. Uh, telephone and light was not a separate category and so on and had to be, that was all put, placed in and encompassed. And there are still crisis grants. Now, let's not, uh, let's not uh, oh, misunderstand that. I want to give that. you a couple of exaggerated cases. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there always will be some exaggerated yeah. cases. For instance, I had a woman that. on the air who admitted to defalcations in her income. I recall who, the case. As who a had, fact. as mm -hmm. a matter of what she felt was necessity, leased a house for two years at $600 a month. And her problem, once she stopped uh, the extra money, was that her social service allowance was only $675, and she was paying $600 a month in rent. Now, with a woman like that, with a couple of three children, is she entitled to go for the $600 rental lease because she can't find anywhere else to live? because there isn't the cheap housing available for these desperate cases with families. I think it's very difficult to take a broad uh, approach to that particular case. And, and I recall the case, but and we no, won't but it's mention a si names. No, it's a but, situation which exists. But it's exists. a situation that exists. But let me just, let's just take a look at that case. That was a mother of three teenage children, very capable of working. And there are many, many thousands upon thousands of Canadians and British Columbians who, before there was anything called income assistance or welfare, went out to work and raised their children and did very well, thank you. Now, that lady was obviously articulate, had capabilities. She had been working, and she still has the capability of working. And I think the, the problem that I always have, and the problem I think that any human resource minister will have in this province is, where do you divide that line? How do I say, for instance, to the, to the uh, person who is paying taxes in this province, who is on minimum wage, and let me tell you, they have a difficult time. They're renting a house.
they're having a very difficult time. And how do you explain to them that, that you expect to provide through taxation for a way of life for someone to live where you cannot provide for them? It almost takes the incentive away for those on lower income, on the lowest income, to even go out to work in the morning. Now that's the balance that one has to... But has your to government and governments before you have failed one way or another in supplying any stock of subsidized housing, any appreciable stock of subsidized housing, whereby these people can live within your allowances? Well, I would question that. First of all, uh, our record in, in our Social Credit Administration has been excellent in terms of senior citizens' housing, and so that particular area well, can I do of that housing, senior citizens, yes. and also our housing program in Social Credit has been, it's led the country. We have home ownership in this province that has led the country and has given capabilities and opportunities for people to have home ownership above above Up any until other now. above well, any now other. It's impossible, isn't it? Well, that's a, a market situation which I'd love to address. That's a question of supply and demand and inventory of homes, and I'd be pleased to discuss that with you. But but let's zero in on those who are in income assistance and having a difficult time. Um, I would, I would say this, that uh, first of all, we started the subsidized housing program in, in partnership with the federal government in terms of low-income housing. You say our record has been miserable. Uh, our record is... I'm saying you've all failed. We, uh, yes, and I... I Especially but, nowadays. But let, let me just say this to you. You've just... Um, you know, I, I've had uh, housing, uh, subsidized housing in my own constituency, and I've viewed it all over... Uh, the country, and I suggest to you that that probably isn't the answer. I think I would like to give people the capability of uh, those who are in need, the capability of a decent way of life, and uh, the capability of those who can work and get into a no, work I situation. I don't agree, to with have you, their own disagree with you philosophically, but when you look at the situation today, where people on income assistance or on minimum wages are faced with unlimited rent controls the moment it gets above the 300 or the 400 level. There's no way anybody can buy a house now. The average price in Vancouver, 150. Well, now 000. we're getting into the housing situation. I'll be pleased to talk about that. And I'll tell you, I think what we have to do and what we are doing, and the government is addressing this, is making a larger inventory of, of uh, houses and, and rental accommodations. And this year, we'll see that, that come into being. And if we have a, a greater inventory, and that's the answer to it. Land. It, well, we, are, we have, you heard uh, Mr. Vanderselm's announcement, and it has not had a good uh, ride, if you'll pardon the expression, on LRT. It has not had a good ride in the, in the greater Vancouver area, and it should have because it's going to provide housing, it's going to provide transportation to housing. And he and Jimmy Chabot, the housing minister, made a joint announcement regarding that. But how long? 19,000 lots is nothing to be sneezed at. When? The, it, within, within this next 18 months, those will come on stream. Don't you sometimes think in your social credit cabinet meetings and caucus that you should lift the land, please, and let it go, fall where it may? Would you be don't agreeable, you some, would you be agreeable not, to that? I'm not here to give opinions, Mr. McCarthy. <laughs> I'm here to, don't you think that perhaps the way to do it is to lift the land freeze? I think uh, the land freeze or the, uh, or the, the uh, land uh, freeze that we had on prior to uh, being defeated in 1972 in some form is necessary to retain agricultural land. I think that it's absolutely foolhardy to have such uh, criteria spelled out that there are lands that could never be farmed, could never be used for agricultural purposes, that uh, are tied up in the land freeze and increasing the price. It wasn't until the land freeze that the houses in Vancouver took such a tremendous... Plus uh, immigration, external and internal, right? You mean to put a limit on... on uh, no, I'm saying the land freeze plus external and internal immigration moving from the east to here has... We still have the capability of bringing all the people in of Canada, as we did last year, 65,000 other Canadians who moved from other parts of Canada to enjoy our prosperous British Columbia. We still have that capability, and I think that we'll always have that capability. Let's do your detailed allowances for human resources. We're not, we're not allowed to call it welfare anymore, are we? Well, you can call it what you will. I prefer income assistance. After the break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mrs. McCarthy, what's the budget for human resources this year, the current new budget? Uh, it's about uh, almost $900 million, over $2 million each and every day. 
How much is that more than last year? Uh, we have an increase of uh, some, uh, it's, I think it's approximately 12% uh, this year. 12% increase, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see table one, which, and you can tell me what it is so that okay. people know what they're getting. All right. Uh, oh, that's, that's not a very good table to look at, is it? Well, this shows the, uh, for the... Uh, this is the handicap benefits. This is the uh, gain for um, handicapped and uh, seniors not on, that are, that, uh, are uh, getting a quarterly uh, now indexed. Uh, You've indexed the, the gain for the handicapped and the seniors, is now that remember, correct? remember, yes, this, is, this was indexed by the federal administration and this shows what it will be on April the 1st, the maximum benefit. Now this is the maximum, everybody won't receive it. Uh, All right, for a couple it's $458.11. Which is an increase of $77 over the year before. No, no, for a couple it's $800. And for a couple, it's eight eight dollars, and for a single, it's four hundred and fifty-six, I think. Right. That's an increase of uh, fifteen and twenty percent. Uh, twenty percent for the single and fifteen oh. percent for the couple. Let's mm -hmm. try one more of these tables, although they're not no. coming up properly. Let's try one again. Okay. Next one. The next one. This no. is a family example for a parent and children on their standard allowances now plus their increases. Right. And in the old one, they got 647, and in the new one, they get 710. One parent and two children. Now, that includes a maximum of $300 for rent and 60 for utilities, correct? That's correct. Uh, if now, if I don't pay $300 for rent, I don't get the $300, that's do correct. I? That's uh correct. -huh. I get what I actually pay for it. You, that's exact, you get the exact amount. Uh -huh. In the old days, you used to have crisis grants to meet the payments. Now, you set the maximum of $300 for that group for rent. That's right. And if they pay $400, they still only get $300. Yes, but these rents, remember, are based on uh, the uh, experience that we have. Uh, Agreed. Uh, but if they only pay 200 in a subsidized unit of some we kind, don't give the extra you don't hundred. give the extra 100. No. What allowances Actual. do you now give? How much is one entitled to make now on the side on income assistance without it coming in, affecting your income? For the couples, $100. For the families, and $50 for the singles. And remember, these amounts that you see on the charts do not include family allowance, do not include medical care and dental care and all of the other services which are, are also uh, part of the uh, uh, those So the allowances benefits. we've been showing don't include family allowance, family allowance dental care, Medicare, medical card, Mm -hmm. of Dendicare, all the hundred bucks a couple can make. I thought you were going to increase that. Well, that's under consideration. Uh, you said that the last time. Yes, but it's still under consideration because there is, uh, uh, there is also uh, the new uh, opportunity plan, which uh, offers something to these people, which I think is a better way than to, to perhaps have them earn $50 or $100. And so we have had that implemented in September, and that's working so well that I think that that may be for those who can work. I want to try one more of these tables. They're mm -hmm. not as good as I thought, I, was, I thought they were on camera. Who is this? This is a single example. This is the last one we'll do. Under the old scheme, they got a total of 321 with a maximum shelter of 130, correct? 130. That's Under correct. the new scheme, they get mm -hmm. 375. And their shelter, you notice, has been increased uh, quite dramatically for an increase, an overall increase of 16% or $54. And that pays tribute to the fact that you were speaking about the problems with shelter and the cost of shelter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's tough, though, isn't it? Yes, e it is. Living on yes. that. The point is that now that everyone expects the same standard of living and the same kind of accommodation, and that's the way society must be, is it not, nowadays? I don't know. I, you know, I have a, I, I, I really do believe that the answer that we have in the opportunity plan will, will give more money to people in but, true need, no, and will, me. and will I hope, take some of the people who are in this this group of people. We have sixty-five thousand people on income assistance. Thirty-eight thousand of them are unemployed employables. Last night, my husband and I were out. You mean to dinner. people who can work who can work. Mm -hmm. Last night my husband and I were out to dinner and uh, a group of young people celebrating a birthday spoke to us and we had a very uh, nice conversation with them. 
And one of the questions from one of the young people was on the recent rates. How much would a couple get? And what they, they knew a couple who were going to be getting married. And I said, I hope they're not going to get married and live on income assistance. I hope they're not planning income assistance. You're young enough, you're in your 20s, you're young enough to, to have an opportunity. Get to the Ministry of Human Resources office and get those people to the Ministry of Human Resources office so they will not plan to get married on income assistance. Surely in this city, uh, in Vancouver, and in the province of British Columbia that is so prosperous, that has so much employment, so many opportunities, that the young people can certainly get jobs in this province today. No question of it. But we have almost a nil unemployment rate, Jack. Yeah? I know that, but here you're coming up again with another job opportunity plan. Is that what you call Don't it? Be job cynical. Don't be Just cynical. Just a minute. I went all through <laughs> the, what was the one that Galadi used to run? Well, provincial that was called Alliance the Provincial of Business Alliance Men. of Businessmen, which called on the business people of the province to, to, to provide opportunities. And you know something, it worked quite well. And then we had PrEP. And PrEP has worked quite well, too. That was Van der Zandt's plan, yes. PrEP. Yes, I'm quite proud of the PrEP program. But let me tell you and what's the weakness of that. And now you've got the individual, opp individual opportunity plan, yeah. which is just another way to get people in and tell them how to apply for jobs. No, it isn't. It isn't? No, it's different. How much time we got in this segment? We'll show one of your little clips in that, and people can decide whether or not okay. it's just a propaganda dress-up thing or a real thing. All right, let me tell you what the clip is. The clip is uh, the Job Action Program, which is part of a series of services. And this is one that works for some people, particularly this young group that I spoke to last night at dinner. And I think that, uh, I think that you'll appreciate. These are okay. income assistance people who have taken a these course. These young people last night, were these income assistance people at your table? They told me that they weren't. They told you that but they knew others who were. I hate to ask you where you were having dinner. It was either Big Mac or Giardino. <laughs> I'm not sure which. Do I, d it, is it all right to advertise? Sure. <laughs> Ray and I went to Mother's and it was a very nice uh, Never had very nice. Place. Oh, you'd like it. It's okay, very what nice. are you going to call pleasant. this new thing? Garlic bread's good. <laughs> Individual opportunity <laughs> plan? A job action program? Well, you see, the, the opportunity plan is a series of things. It's like a smorgasbord of, of services. You can get job training here, or you can get uh, the manpower assistance here, a job subsidy there, but it's geared to your individual case. How much is it going to cost? How many new civil servants are you No new civil service, although we do have uh, some new civil service uh, within this new budget, which will help us in our field staff, but that that was needed because we are being called on for okay, family we'll and children's we'll, services. We'll take so. a clinical and I'll take a cynical look at this after the break. Okay. <laughs> I'll be taking questions to Mrs. McCarthy shortly on the new allowances, but in the meantime, I want you to see a clip of a little film done by her department on the individual opportunity plan. There'll be 200 places throughout British Columbia where people who are in income assistance can go and get help uh, to find a job opportunity, she tells me. And here are a couple of people from her film clip telling you some of their successes on this particular I program. I architects in Victoria. I phoned 11 architects, and out of those 11 phone calls, I got 11 face-to-face -face interviews. Out of those 11 face-to-face -face interviews, I was asked to come back by three people, and the first person that I went back for my return interview, I was hired that day. And I just sort of gave up on bureaucracies. I didn't think they could help, you know. Um, and when I was referred here by Ministry of Human Resources, um, I wasn't really quite sure how to take it. I didn't know what it was about, you know, what they were going to do or, or whatever. So I just took it as it came, and. You know, it works. <laughs> There's one of your clients saying it works. Now yes, you it tell does. me about this job opportunity plan and we'll decide if it really okay. works. Okay. Well, very quickly, the job opportunity plan is a series of opportunities for people. It could be for a young single mother who uh, is left alone with children and wants to get back into the job market and give an opportunity to her young children. And so she may want to be trained to be a hairdresser so she can get into the educational course and she she agrees with this agreement with us this contract if you like to take the course to stay in the course and then to graduate and then get back to work we also agree to a few things we ad agree for daycare services we agree to assist her in her job and uh, and getting her job then there are those who have fallen out if you like the youngster who quits school the dropout gets on to income assistance has no help from home 
uh, has lost uh, their ambition and their uh, incentive to work. So we've put them into this job action program that you've just seen on the, on the uh, television. And the job action program is uh, one which is a three-week course. And we did a pilot project in Victoria. It has an 80% success rate and even a higher success rate in the Vancouver model. And now they're going throughout the province. And it's a three-week course patterned after San Diego, the one that I, I went down to see the, a year and a half ago. And do you know that that program gets people by dialing a phone, shows them how to, to apply for a job, but it gives them something else. It also identifies their strengths, their weaknesses, and we build on their how strengths. How do you pick the people? Only people on income assistance qualify for this. That's correct. So uh -huh. your, your workers go down the list and say, hey, he looks like a bit of a layabout. Let's have him in. No, it's a voluntary thing. He's got to come in. Yes, he has to come out in. And I guess you'd say it's Alcoholics Anonymous in reverse. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous it cures people of alcoholism by getting them to stop. And that has to be voluntary. They have to want to. Motivation. And in our income assistance program, our job opportunity program, and our whole, our whole program, we say that if these people wish to get off income assistance, we can help. And we're there to help, and our counselors can and assist them. And they get them. the normal allowances while they're on the three-week oh, yes. course. Mm -hmm. How yes. many take the course at one time? Uh, well, it varies. Uh, just last week, there were 15 young people, uh, all of them um, who had had some problems with uh, prison records but usually it's around 20. Now, you don't take older people into this job opportunity Oh, yes, we do. And we've had some remarkable uh, successes. But how long has it been going? It's been going since last uh, July, I think, that pilot project. But the others have been started since about uh, November, December in different parts. We have one in uh, Parksville. Uh, we have uh, one in Surrey. We have uh, a couple in Vancouver. Really, you're Dawson duplicating. Creek. Are you not duplicating what is supposed to be the effort? I mean, somebody's spending a fortune in television commercials for women, the outreach program, and one gets the impression that any woman anywhere in the country can waltz into any manpower job and be outfitted in new clothes and sent to Puscope for a job which we'll get. Are you kind of duplicating manpower? No, manpower, that's also what's different with the opportunity plan. Uh, you see, it does encompass the manpower and immigration. It encompasses the education ministry of our provincial and also the ministry of labor in our provincial government. So we have three ministries working together with the federal ministry of uh, manpower, and we're all coordinating our efforts. And I have to tell you, that's a first. I can believe that. But <laughs> the person who comes to you to learn how to, what his skills are and how to apply for a job, He's got to come to you in the first instance, and then he's got to push the job applications himself or herself. Well, that's what's different, too. You know, you mentioned the PrEP program. I want to tell you the PrEP program was very successful, but the problem was that we found the jobs. Correct. And we said to John Doe, you will go to work in this job. We matched the person to a job. Mm -hmm. And half the time, they wouldn't stay, and their, and their record Didn't was... Didn't like it. That's right, and their, their, the mortality rate on that one was too great. In this case, you give the people some basic training in job applications, if nothing else, for and getting the hairdressing. That's right. And mm -hmm. they make the... And they make the, the initial contact, and as they individuals. seek out their own place. In, they have a goal. They have a goal laid out, and Sounds they know where they're going. It's great. I tell you, we, I, I, we, anybody listening who is on income assistance and wants to get into the job market, if they go to the Ministry of Human Resource offices throughout this province, we can help them. And we, we'll do it with uh, uh, the and greatest And you've got a potential 38,000 people who can help, be helped by right. this. That's right, yeah. 38,000 employable unemployed. That's right. On income assistance. That's correct. Men and women of all mm -hmm. ages. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't knock it until you've tried it, I don't suppose. Well, it's different because... You know how we uh, in the media tend to knock these things Oh, do I ever. ...kind of funny statistics. Well, I certainly do know that. One of the things we haven't done, you'll notice, we haven't said how many we're going to manage to get off welfare. We're, we're not making any claims because uh, then that becomes the whole, the whole exercise, trying to justify to Jack Webster and all of the news media how many people we have off income assistance since day one. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in getting people back to work and letting them give their children and their families the opportunities that you and I have. We have, we have those opportunities in the province. I think the unemployment rate, for example, in, in the city of Vancouver uh, is such that it's practically nil. Virtually nil if you're young and, um, that's and, right. and physically Absolutely. able. Absolutely. Mind you, not a fancy money. 
And of course, everybody what? nowadays, after all your great generosity and yet to come, wants to work for the provincial government with a 35-hour week and $10.50 an hour and an no index question. pension. No question. No question. Expectations. You've certainly been generous employers, haven't you? Well, all provincial governments across the country have been too question. generous. Question. Unquestionably. Back to my own line of country now. Question. The professional group may picket parliament buildings this afternoon at 4.05. I think there's 1,200 professionals who you've offered them 8 and 12 and they want 12 and 12. Accountants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hypothetical question, but you'll answer both of them, I'm sure. <laughs> if the professional union pickets the parliament building, will you cross the picket line? Absolutely. Do you think all of the NDP will cross the picket line? Well, I, I can never uh, speak for them, as you know. <laughs> well, what do you think? Cause some trouble. Do you think it would be wise if You're any... You're the troublemaker at this table, not me. <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't know. I'm dying to see what happens. Sure, if I... they pick at the Parliament building, sure. I'm just the test of whether or not an NDP member will cross any picket line. It'll be interesting to see, won't it? Won't it? It certainly will be. You'd love if half a dozen of them didn't cross. Well, I don't know. I, uh, I, you I know where I stand. During I'd the next election campaign, yeah. that man was in the pay of the unions. It wouldn't uh, do the people's business because he refused <laughs> to cross a picket line to do well, his public duty. The people of British Columbia, I think, read that rather well through all of this labour strife. I don't know. About it. Questions and calls to Grace McCarthy after the break. Start on what? <laughs> I'm glad you're taking the telephone calls and not me this morning. So will you tell people to come straight at you with the problems? Mm -hmm. No nice good mornings. <coughs> Question and answer. Because I don't feel my brightest this morning, Grace, to tell you the truth. Well, uh, you know, I told you that I had a touch of flu over the weekend, so uh, I'm not feeling that great either. So we're in great shape for these calls. But anyway, we're looking forward to them. <laughs> to you? I'm not looking forward oh, to them. Oh, I am. But you well, are, am. you see. Sure. You're well, the, that's how people learn about the service and what we can do. You're the perpetual politician. Am I really? Gee, I never yeah. thought I was like that. Really? Go ahead to Grace McCarthy. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is that me, Jack? Keep it short and sharp. Yes, right. Uh, it's about disabled. Uh, the uh, surgical and medical supplies of it that we are supplied with. Um, a lot of things have been cut back on, which we have to be pay for ourselves now uh, through Mr. Camose's office. They're prescribed by the doctors, uh, but you have cut back on a lot of these things, and it's costing us a lot of money. Maybe some of us seventy to eighty dollars a month. Okay, specifically what was paid for before is not now paid for. Right, they've cut back on a lot of these things. Specifically what? Uh, well, mostly medical and surgical supplies, such as uh, dressings, uh, uh, tapes, and other sort of things, which seem minimal but cost quite a lot of money at the moment. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, Chris McCarthy? Do you know about this? I've heard the complaint, and we've had it looked into. One of the people who were who led the way in this is the BC Division of the Canadian Paraplegic Association. I've been meeting with them and with Mr. Camozzi, who looks after our... our I think your, um, your point uh, is well taken. I think that uh, what you're saying is that there are... are problems of surgical supplies that are above the norm that should be paid for and uh, we have had meetings on it and uh, the problem has been is drawing the line at some things that some people take for granted they want on a special uh, a, a special uh, allowance uh, things that other people pay for in quite normal way. We have a system whereby whether it's hardship a person can be repaid for additional things like dressing. Oh, I have arranged uh, some, some special uh, arrangements for very many clients. Uh, I can give you uh, uh, quite a few cases that of examples where they've been brought to my attention, where I, I have felt it as Must a Must it be brought to your attention to a special no, payment of additional supplies? No, to the regional manager of the Ministry of Human Resources. If it's resources. anything other than a couple of dollars, it should be paid for by human resources? I can't make that a blanket statement. It has to be handled individually. You're not unsympathetic, Kate. No, I'm not unsympathetic. I appreciate Is that that's a help? exactly the problem that you're... Is that a help, Carla? That's a help, uh, Jack, but the one other thing I want to get to you is the home care and the homemakers. 
Carry on. The home care, the homemakers uh, program, which is excellent. But I find out now through the new labor laws, which started last Wednesday, uh, that people, uh, some of the staff they have, which are on part time, uh, have clients for only two hours, but they've got to be paid for four. But that's uh, provincial it very legislation. Uh, for some of the people like ourselves and myself that mm -hmm. only need two hours help a day. Well, could I just explain that? That? Uh, that isn't in my ministry. Uh, that's Ministry of Health. But the um, uh, the provincial labor legislation always has said that if you work for four hours or two hours or one hour a day, one has to be paid for the four. In other words, uh, if that that just is labor legislation, and but that's been in for many years. It's a question of efficient use. Surely, if the home care can use them for four hours, they will use them for four hours if they're sure. paying them for four hours. Oh yes. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Madam morning. Minister. I've heard a, a lot of people knocking your ministry, and let me remind you, perhaps, of the letter I wrote to you about a year and a half ago, in which I thanked you after I escaped from Iran and had open-heart surgery and... I remember. That was a beautiful letter. ...and being a performer professional who had no, nowhere to turn, had lost everything in Iran, I, for one, am very, very grateful for what assistance has been given. And I think that instead of us knocking the ministry, we should pay some tribute to the many fine, dedicated people you have. And, Madam Minister, I, for one, who live on very pitiful means, but I'm thankful to be alive, and I'm very grateful to the ministry, and I don't want to see and hear all of the people who phone Jack with all of their bitching and complaining but where would they be if there wasn't a ministry so aptly named of human resources? Well, that's a, that's a beautiful statement to our, our ministry staff, and I really do thank you. The letter that you wrote was really heartening to me because very seldom do people take the time to write. But I tell you that our people in the Ministry of Human Resources are, are just that, and they're very resourceful and they're very humane, and I do thank you for that accolade to them because they do a great job. Thank Thanks you so very much. much. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack, would you please answer this question for me as truthfully as you possibly can? We already have on our uh, uh, minimum uh, welfare check, uh, monthly welfare check, it's already about $150 more than you can collect on unemployment insurance. Now, given the choice between living on welfare at the minimum wage or getting the equivalent amount from welfare for sitting around on your butt doing nothing, which choice are you going to make, Jack? And if uh, you were on welfare in other parts, in colder parts of Canada, how would you uh, handle an influx, of, a massive influx of people from uh, other parts of Canada uh, living in welfare coming to BC to, to, to sign on on BC welfare? Well, you're a little complicated. You're asking me if I'd rather live in welfare than live in a lesser amount of unemployment insurance. Yeah, well, Rosemary, uh, Rosemary Brown suggests that the minimum, uh, the uh, amount of welfare should equivalent the minimum wage. Now, well, if I'm you not going to answer that like question. That, I shall ask Grace McCarthy to answer the question. Are there people who are living on welfare rather than qualifying for unemployment insurance? No, you have to uh, you have to get unemployment insurance. If you qualify for unemployment you insurance, must collect it. you collect unemployment insurance. It's when your unemployment insurance runs out that you can then apply for income assistance. And unemployment insurance is better in most cases than income assistance, is it not? I understand it is. I'm afraid you're wrong in that, sir. But obviously, fifty dollars less. But but the point you make is the, is the point that I tried to make earlier with Jack. And the point that you make is that there is a very fine line that this ministry must walk between those who are on low income and, and those, those who are on, who are on welfare. Assistance. Otherwise, you cross the line and, and people get more on welfare than they get on minimum wage. And the incentive is taken away. Now, let me just say this to you. That's a good point. I'll it, agree with that. But it, it's also a point which... Uh, le let me just also say that, that people create a climate of acceptability for income assistance in this country. How many times have we heard in the past few, few weeks even that there's an unemployment problem? I saw an article, a full page article, a week ago Saturday in the Sunday Sun 
or in the, the uh, Whenever. weekend uh, paper, and it was on a subject that was entirely different. It was on racial discrimination. But in the four articles on racial discrimination, four people were quoted as saying that the terrible unemployment problems were inciting the problems we have in racial discrimination as if it were a fact of life. They say it and it becomes a fact of life. We've never had unemployment in 16 years, as low as it is today, and never as many opportunities to work. What I'm saying is we create these myths that aren't correct. We <coughs> say that women shouldn't go out and work, and this will bring on a whole lot of telephone calls. But I've been a working mother all my life, and I have two beautiful children, well-adjusted, fabulous children uh, to, to show for it. And I don't feel there's anything wrong with, with women going out to work, Jack. And I don't think there's anything wrong with suggesting that women who are left alone should go out to work. And I think that right here in this, this marvelous production center, I think that you can find all kinds of women in this particular production center of CTV that are working single parents. You're getting off the point. I'm I don't know how that came off at all. The point I'm, saying, I'm saying that what the gentleman is saying is that, that uh, the low-income people are getting fed up with paying some of the taxes to provide the services which we provide. And I sympathize with them. But I'm, I'm also sympathetic to the people who are on income assistance and need, are in truly in need. Now let's take that group in between and let's do our best to get them back into a productive way of life so we can give more help to those who are truly in need. I was going to make a point, but I've lost it. I think it was regarding uh, the amounts. unemployment it was insurance. Not. Was regarding it not? amounts. If you're a four-person group, we'll say that one adult and three small children. Yes. On the table here under the new rate, you get $400 cash plus a maximum shelter rate of $400, right? For a maximum of $800. For a maximum of $800. And then you get on top of that your medical card. Yes. You now get a medical card as a yes. matter of right. Yes. And you get your family allowance. Yes. And you have the opportunity to make one hundred tax extra, credit. Child tax credit and one hundred dollars cash extra. Pharmacare. Not and pharmacare not reportable. So you, do you think that those in social assistance here are as well treated as anywhere in the world? Oh, probably better than any place in the world. Okay, thank you very much. It's a point. I'll take a break. Hold on. Yeah, you've got to, you know, sometimes one gets so confused because you're attacked politically on a percentage basis all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that does bother me, I know that you, you and the NDP both claim to have done a great deal of housing, but it doesn't seem to be that much around apart from the senior citizens. Yeah, but I happen to have... We're still on the air, after the break. Grace McCarthy, Minister of Human Resources, Deputy Premier. I'm always far too nice to you, Grace. I know you are. Yeah. I know that News Hour has given you a bad time, but, you know, I'm They such feel a that's their obligation, don't they? It is their duty. Is it? I do it to other people, and uh -huh. if I have to, I'll do it to you, too. Of course too. you will, I know. No you special know favors, no, no special treatment, just like social all. credit. And certainly you were right at the weekend that your image needs mending. Well, of course, part of that image has been created by the very news hour that you spoke of. Oh, come <laughs> off it. Your, your premier comes off the plane and scuttles away into hiding from Japan, that kind of thing. You're not nearly as upfront as you but should be as a government. But don't you recall that that same news hour made a pact before the premier went away that they would not they would wait until a Tuesday news conference? You don't. No, and I think the premier, like the prime minister, should be tackled whenever and whatever he appears. Oh, and anywhere. I think the, the, the premier thinks the same thing, but I think that he feels he didn't want to give special treatment to one news. Ah gathering group don't when the rest of them had honored the agreement. Gracie, don't give me that garbage. Do you really mean to tell me that you have a really unbiased news hour? Is that yeah, what you're, you're saying? Is that They're right? as unbiased as I am. <laughs> How does that grab you? Yes, but you're supposed to be biased. You're supposed you mean to I'm be. supposed to be biased. No, I accept that in you because you're a, you're a commentator. No, no. We, and I think that you news commentate on social Any news issues department and news must issues. attack the government. I mean, we must well, keep a close eye on you people. Of course, they find it a great obligation because the opposition has been so weak that they have to. <laughs> the opposition has been so quiet. I'll give you that Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Why? Sh why should they say anything with the, with the, some of your your people doing the work for them? Well, maybe the smart just lying in the weeds. Hmm? Well, I would never cr credit them with being that This is smart. a pointless conversation. Let's get on with business. <laughs> From, I'm not in the sweetest mood this morning. You're not bad, actually. I've seen you worse, you I'm know. I'm grinding my teeth. You're getting uh, close What's to holiday time, aren't you? 
You mind your business now, my <laughs> friend. Cam Loops, go ahead, please. Uh, good morning, Mr. Webster and Mrs. McCarthy. Good morning. I have uh, something that I want to discuss with you about the income opportunity program that you have, and it deals with the human resources in Cam Loops. Yeah. Okay, let's have it straight up. Okay, recently I completed a course. I've gone to human resources, asked for help in finding a job. But you can only make phone calls to them between 10 and 12, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and you can't get through anywhere else to talk to them. I had a job opportunity. It was out of town. Couldn't get a hold of human resources to get out of town to go to the job. Where do you live? Right in Kamloops? Right in Kamloops. And you're saying the line, are the line busy or just, or what? No, they don't take calls except uh, between 10 and 12, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh, I find that difficult to believe, and I'll certainly check up on it, because all of our Ministry of Human Resources offices are to be on the phones just between regular office hours. Now, may I just suggest this to you uh, and, and ask you this question? If you were anxious and couldn't get through because the line was busy or they weren't taking calls or whatever, and leave that to me. I'll certainly find that out. But tell me, why didn't you go... give you the name of the social worker there that But why didn't you go down to the... between... Oh. I'll take the name in a moment. Why didn't you go down to the office? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. Well, you go down to the office, but you can't get in to see the social worker unless you have an appointment, and you can only set the appointment up between 10 and 12, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, give me the name of the social worker off the air. Okay, good enough. Hold on again, I'll put you back on the air. He's saying that you set up this job opportunity program that he went down, you took the course, and you enjoyed the course, right? Right. It was useful. And you needed money to get out of town to a job. You'd arranged it as a result of this new motivation. Right. And you couldn't see a social worker even. Did you go down? No, you didn't go down. Yes, I did. I went down there three times. And okay, time the it... minister will look into it and let me okay. know the score. But oh, and Gladys, you better take his name, too. I, I'd like to get back to you on that, so if you'd leave your name on the air. Name a number, five, But also, five, I'd like five. to say this to those of you out there who have perhaps had a similar experience, and I certainly hope you haven't, but let me just give you a modus operandi. If there is any problem in getting through to a social worker, there's a regional director in each and every area, and there's also a supervisor in each and every area. And if you are not getting through to a social worker because of some problems, and they do have a heavy workload, oh, and, yeah. and thank goodness that that is going to be relieved with an increase in our field staff budget this year, and we will give, I hope, better service, but, but because of the pressures on them, and they have some great ones, um, besides being patient, I wonder if you'd also get in touch with the supervisor, the regional director, and they will assist to clear the way. That's what they're that what I mean, we're there I, for. I don't, I don't want to knock any particular social worker at all because I know what the load is like because I get a lot of overflow calls and how they handle some of these problems is beyond my comprehension. Most of them are non-handleable in any way, shape or form. They have the patience of Job you know, and they the have a lot of You know, the desperation calls that come to me mm -hmm. sometimes, I shake my head and say, oh, oh. I know. Go to your MLA. It's about all I you know. can do, really. I know. I've received all of them. Thank you. And you've had them all. Yeah. Okay, get that chap's name. We're not after the social worker in Kamloops. There may well be an explanation, but the minister would certainly like to find out. Yes, Wouldn't I really you? would. Yes, I really would. Thank, Thank you very much. Burns Lake. Yes. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Good morning, Mrs. McCarthy. Good morning. Yes, I had the uh, misfortune to have to deal with uh, human resources here this year for the first time in my life. So I will be writing you a letter about it. And I've never been so degraded or felt so cheap in my whole life and insulted by the worker. Uh, I tell you, it's the last time I'll do anything before I ever have to deal with those people again. Well, well I'm really sorry to hear that because really, well, just they a minute. Do let, let me ask him some questions. What was your problem? Out of work? Well, I was out of work. My unemployment got messed up, and I was had, I have a family of two children and wife, and uh, the rent was due, or else and I had to pay the rent, and I went and got it, and like I say, I was never so insulted and degraded. For the first time in my life, I had to get something from somebody, and uh, he made me feel like I was a professional, uh, layabout, you call it, but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, that happens on occasion. If you've written to the minister, I'm sure she'll answer it. Yes, I definitely will. Write to the minister, for Thank sure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. One more segment, yes, with Grace McCarthy, Minister of Human Resources, Ministress of Human Resources person in charge of human resources after the break.
You hate this job? You no, I love it. So I really do like it. It's the toughest thing in the cabinet. Well, I don't know. I don't find it that way. I really do enjoy it. I, I love working with my staff. They're fa fabulous people to work with. You've never said a nasty thing on MD except BCTV News out in your life. Oh, that's not true. There are some of your people I really adore. Like Clive. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello, uh, Mrs. McCarthy. Good morning. Yes, uh, uh, what I, one thing I'd like to know is um, I've got quite a few friends who are on social assistance. We're not, thank goodness, but for anybody that thinks that these people enjoy being on it are all wet because they don't. That's right. Yeah. But I've got a girlfriend that has tried to get off it, but I don't think you people give them the proper incentive to get off. Why don't you, instead of giving them more money on a silver platter, which, you know, which is, okay, 710 now, why don't they leave it down and take away that minimum that they can earn over and above it? This well, we tried that. This to eventually work mm -hmm. to get themselves off welfare, because my girlfriend had a part-time job. She could only earn $400 on this part-time job, and she went to her worker and said, if I earn this $400, will you just make up the difference mm -hmm. so that at least I've got a start? And they wouldn't mm -hmm. do it. No, I, I appreciate that, but now... There is a problem with that, and we did try this as a pilot project in Van Victoria, and the reason we did it in Victoria was that it's easily containable geographically. And uh, so we did it in Victoria, and we ran the project for over a year. And it was a pilot project when I first became the minister two years ago, because I had the same idea. If one is allowed to retain earnings on a graduated scale, uh, then eventually uh, you're off income assistance and you're on to your, your working. So you're allowed to retain more and more as you go along. Right. Uh, I have to tell you, and I wish I, I wish I'd, it had worked because I wanted it to work. It did not work. Why? Those who, who went on the program were in effect, we were discriminating against the rest of the province because they were able to retain more earnings and um, it, the result was not that they, that they got themselves off income assistance eventually. It was just, it was actually a disaster. It was too bad. It was just a bad experiment. They stayed on income assistance after the, uh, the year and a half was up. It was, not a, uh, it was not an incentive to get themselves off. They just simply fell back into the income assistance ways and they would not let go of that security <coughs> blanket called income assistance. Why well, don't they, is, okay, now that I am a mother with two children, fortunately they're in high school, but, okay, I don't believe that a, a mother with preschool children should be forced to go out and work because this is when their children need them. But once the children get to high school, why aren't these people forced to take on a part-time job? That's because our Canada assistance plan in Canada does not allow us to make those kinds of decisions. We can only qualify for the 50-50 sharing with the federal government if we abide by the candidate assistance the plan rules, rules and we just cannot uh, we cannot uh, depart from them i would like to address myself to the statement you've just made but first of all on your friend that uh, wishes to have help ask her please to go down to the ministry office make an appointment get on the opportunities plan that in effect is the best of both worlds between those those uh, two concepts that you and i have discussed but the second thing is again it isn't for everyone to go out to work and i am not going to say universally it is for everybody to leave small children and go to work but I also say it isn't for everybody to, to stay home and look after small children and, uh, and get into the state of mind where they are no good to those children. And, I, and, and, and that happens more times than enough. Now, there has to be an individual kind of approach to this, and you can't blanket everybody with the same thing. And you see, if we continue to say the myth, that all mothers must, must uh, stay home and look after their children. You put guilt on those who go out to work, and you uh, sometimes deny those very children the very help that you expect for your children. You expect them to grow up in a household that has no. proper toys and proper uh, instructional aids and proper food and so on, but you're denying it to, to, to a lot of youngsters who would perhaps be better off if their parent took a job and gave them the kind of love that they, can, that they can give and gave them the kind of financial support that they could have if they worked. So Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Good morning, Grace. 
Good morning. I would like to know from the minister uh, if there's any movement in the future uh, to hire more Native Indians within the ministry in jobs mm -hmm. other than auxiliary positions. Well, I would certainly like to see uh, many more opportunities and many more Native Indian people working in our ministry particularly because we have uh, a need for them. We hope, uh, we already have uh, some uh, good uh, Native Indian workers within our, within our ministry and of course throughout the, the government services. Uh, we would like to see more and uh, we just hope that that opportunity and I, we just hope they'll apply and that's, uh, I can only concur, we need them very much. The answer is yes, my friend. Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's also, familiar. I sat in on several meetings or some meetings with, with other uh, ministry personnel uh, out at UBC with regard to the change over uh, from the very conservative school of social work uh, with varying degrees, different attitudes and whatever, uh, to get more Indians applying for the School of Social Work. Um, you know, I, I agree with you that there is a need for mm -hmm. native, more Native uh, Indians. That's up to the School of Social Work and to the various Indian organizations. Hold on, please. Go ahead, please. Mrs. McCarthy. Good morning. I've had a couple of questions, uh, people phoning in to me, about the increase in the handicapped allowance. Um, what I've heard from the people that have phoned me is that of the increase of 81.11, only $7 of that will be going to the support allowance, and the rest is on shelter. Now, I'm not sure of this, and I can't find out the facts, and I wish you could clear up the situation for me so well, I can help these people. Yes, well, I think your best bet uh, is to, to uh, I don't know, if you must be in some kind of a service uh, place where you receive phone calls. I'm with an advocacy. Okay, then I think you would be best then to uh, to get to your nearest ministry office and to ask the ones that you did. You happen to see the program earlier where we showed the rates? <laughs> Frankly, I couldn't see the charts. Okay, I'm sorry about that, but those, as you know, are not part of income assistance. Those are part of um, of an uh, an indexed uh, with the federal government in agreement, and they're indexed every four months. Right. And uh, by April the first, they'll go up to that particular point, uh, given, of course, that uh, the federal government come through with the regular increases. And I'm sorry, then I must clip you. My thanks to Grace McCarthy, Ministry of Human Resources, Deputy Premier of the Province of British Columbia, etc., 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 after the break. I believe we have a biggie tomorrow morning. Oh, a very important person, Mr. Armstrong from Imperial Oil, out to defend oil. No rip-off, says Armstrong. No rip-off. All profits reasonable. Competition kept the price down. Somebody's conning us. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. precisely.